Brian with Cycle News. Uh, we got a fun one for you today. We're actually sitting down with one of the founders and CEO of Stark Future. Uh, last year, you might remember, I got a chance to go to Spain and ride the Stark Varg, the new electric motocross bike. But since the intro, there really hasn't been a ton of news. Uh, obviously, bikes have been delayed from um, you know some production standpoints, but we're gonna give these guys a call today and kind of get to the bottom of what's going on. So follow along, hope you guys learn something new, and we're excited to bring you this video. Thanks. All right. Um... This is uh, Sean and uh, Ryan from Cycle News, and we're getting to spend some time with Anton from uh, the founder of Stark Motorcycle, Stark Future. And um, go ahead and introduce yourself, uh, An Anton, and then uh, we'll we'll follow up with some questions from there. Yeah, thank you guys for for taking the time. Um, yeah, Anton Moss, Swedish uh, guy. I am one of the two founders of uh, Stark and the CEO, and. Uh, yeah, I'm sitting in the factory right now. We're, we're pushing quite hard to uh, start start getting those deliveries out the door that I think quite a lot of people are uh, waiting for right now. So um, I don't know if you want me to go through anything uh, in particular or if that's, oh, that's okay. Yeah, we had just a couple of questions. Um, you know, I think uh, I got the opportunity to do the call when you guys did the kind of worldwide launch in uh, December of uh, 21, I believe. Yep. Um, and then, uh, Ryan got the opportunity to ride the Stark, um, Varg in May in over in Barcelona or over in Spain. Um, uh, Ryan actually picked the bike as a bike of the year for cycle news, uh, as an editor's Thank choice. You. So, uh, <laughs> Thank he, was, you, Ryan. he was very impressed. Yeah. It was an awesome experience to go over there and see everything. I think I was part of the second wave, but, uh, yeah, Anton, how did that go for you guys? I didn't really get a chance to follow up afterwards. So how did that, how did the whole launch go for you guys? Yeah, I mean, it was, of course, very scary. So, I mean, if you look at kind of our, uh, you know, marketing strategy or whatever you'd call it, you know, first we wanted to do like a proper launch of, of the company on the bike to show in a short but also transparent and clear way as possible what we are doing, uh, so what a bike is capable of. But that is, of course, only what we are saying, right? So how do we create some credibility? So we wanted to invite all of the biggest medias in the world, which is why we invited you as well uh, to, to come and ride a bike here. And, you know, it's it's scary because one thing is, of course, what we think and what we believe. And uh, maybe it's easy to get biased, you know, when it's your own baby. Uh, so, uh, yeah, for sure, it was scary to see what, outsiders would, would actually think about trying to bike and um, but in the end it was a great experience some people came with maybe a bit of let's say negative uh, in, like they didn't really believe that electric is going to be good uh, but I think basically I think everyone that when they left were you know quite blown away of what the bike was capable of and, and extremely positive so that is you know, great for us as a team to see that, you know, all that hard work uh, actually resulted in a, a product that we can be proud of. So it was a great experience, extremely tough. I mean, uh, so you guys were there the whole day, which means that our team were there a few hours before and also yeah. a few hours after. <laughs> yeah, so, so many guys in the team had a few 20 hour working days uh, in a row, which is uh, extremely tough. But, you know, fortunately we have an amazing team that pulled through and was able to, to give you guys a good experience there. So yeah, thank you Ryan for cool. coming. Yeah, I was definitely on par with any of the, you know, US intros that we get to go on. And I even told Sean before the call, man, I really hope you guys do a US intro. It would be really fun. Yeah, it would be fun actually. We should, we will do that for sure. Let's nice. see one. Yeah, so one of the um, kind of follow-up questions that uh, we've been hearing from the market, from our readers here in the U.S. is, um, you know, initially the expectation or, or expected delivery timing was the end of 2022. Um, I think that uh, some things changed that, a big one being how many uh, pre-orders you got on the bikes, um, pushed them some things back. Uh, so we want to kind of like... I guess uh, let you share like what uh, what kind of hurdles have been thrown in front of you. Um, you know what was the expectation going in as far as how many bikes you would produce versus reality now, and uh, some of those some of those things if you can tell tell us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure. I mean, before the launch, we expected that we would produce five thousand bikes the first year. We thought that was quite ambitious in terms of how many customers that would be interested in 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 buying this product, um, and you know, with the launch, the first 24 hours, we had 850 orders. So, you know, we started scratching our heads there quite fast. 
you know, shit we, we probably miss calculated here a little bit. Uh, so that changed everything, of course, quite a bit. So the demand was much greater than what we expected. Um, and we had to move. So at that time, uh, we had set up two separate factories. Uh, I mean, considering what we have now, small, uh, but, you know, capable of that volume and a little bit more. But we realized, you know, the potential is going to be much greater than that. So uh, we set up a new factory where, where I'm sitting right now, uh, which is um, uh, 20,000 square meters, which is, uh, uh, I think, it's a little bit less than 200,000 square feet, uh, which should be big enough to produce up to 150,000 bikes per year. So it's not a small operation to build build up that factory and, and those production lines, uh, both for the bike, but also for the battery, which is a highly automated process with robots doing all the critical steps. So it's quite complex. Um, but yeah, that's what we've been busy doing. Then on, on top of that, there has been uh, many crises in the world uh, since we did the launch with, of course, the, the, the COVID pandemic, which is ongoing uh, during the launch, as well as the, uh, unfortunately, the war that we're seeing today in Ukraine, which has also put stops uh, in many ways. So essentially the result of all of those things, um, not only those things, but but those things is that we had to delay the first delivery date. Um, we also, as a company, didn't want to deliver a product that we felt could be uh, optimized more. So we would rather, we, t we took the decision to take a little bit more time to do it right rather than rush it, uh, which is of course extremely difficult when you are a new company and you know everyone is screaming for their order and uh, you know some of course also being disappointed that the order is late but you know it's it's better to maybe disappoint with the delivery date uh, and you know try to overachieve the expectation of the product uh, so so this is kind of our strategy uh, with that and uh, I I hope that will be right I I think so and um, now. We are in the beginning of April, and uh, we are a few weeks away from the first delivery. We are extremely close. Uh, I cannot tell you exactly what day it will be, uh, but we are basically there. Uh, so um, we were uh, working out the, uh, uh, I think it was hopefully the last bug that is now now worked out and the uh, uh, software uh, thing, and now we are extremely close to shipping out that first bike which is a date that we've been waiting for now for for far too long yeah. Very cool. yeah. you, you just got to how, have... many, um, how many bikes actually have been ordered um can you can you say how many that is now yeah uh, now we have roughly eighteen thousand orders um wow. but for the last few months we have uh so, so we're not we don't want to increase the order backlog right now there is yeah. no purpose in, in doing that uh, because we know that there is a bigger demand there. What we need to do is to scale the production now, which is our, our you know full focus. And once we see that that is scaling well, then we can ask for more orders essentially. Um, but right now, this is not uh, the goal. And uh, if you order a bike today, uh, the delivery time is one and a half year, which is extremely long. I think very few people are willing to wait that long. Uh, so you know hopefully we can catch up delivery time so when you want to buy a star car if, if you take that decision you won't have to wait such a long time period um but uh it's it's challenging to scale production that's for sure yeah and i think another thing that uh i know is challenging i hear from other, other small manufacturers especially um and even big manufacturers actually bringing a new bike to the market is uh in, here in the u.s is there's some different regulations even in different states um within our country is is that uh something that you guys are are, are challenged with as well yeah yeah i mean to some extent i mean uh, u.s it's a little bit different from from europe where we have uh quite similar laws but a lot of different countries which creates a bit of complexity uh, of course uh, but then with us you think oh no it is one country but each state is to some extent almost like its own country when it comes to regulations but uh, we have a team in place here internally that is that are working on those things um, and uh, 
uh, we recently passed uh, uh, a very important certification, which means that we can deliver bikes uh, now, and uh, uh, so that we're not expecting that to hold us back, uh, essentially. Uh, but it is also a little bit easier with a non-road legal bike. Uh, so uh, with road legal bikes, the complexity is a little bit higher than than what it is with this one. Yeah. Uh, which is something that we are, of course, preparing for as well. One one other thing, I guess, on, on again on our market here, being being selfish, I guess, thinking about what's going on here. Um, you mentioned maybe the first bikes being delivered here by by the end of April, possibly of this year. Um, would that be somewhere in Europe, or I guess where? I guess where do you expect uh, worldwide, globally? Where do you expect uh, those first bikes to be delivered? And and for our breeders, when when will the first bikes arrive in the U.S.? Yeah, so the first external customer is is an American that was just here to try the bike, uh, Brian yeah, Haskell. I just, I just saw that. That was pretty cool that he got to go over there and ride. Yeah, yeah. So we invited him over, uh, and uh, and uh, he spent a few days here. Uh, spent about six hours on the bike, which is quite a lot on a motocross track. So we got to try it uh, to quite a large extent, and I it was good to see that he he liked the bike, and uh, it was quite funny because we launched here 9 a.m in the morning european time uh that was you know when we officially went out for the first time you know, we never showed our website our name or anything to to anyone uh, we did prepare a few medias uh, about this before the launch but every everyone knew quite clearly we designed confidentiality agreements that this is the hour when you can first show this bike but Brian's order came in seven hours before the launch. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you saying that. You're like, how did he know? Yeah, exactly. That that is quite fun, and uh, I still don't think there is a clear explanation. I don't think he really wants to uh, explain <laughs> that. <laughs> I don't. There is a he has an explanation. I'm not completely sure if uh, you know how he got our website uh, seven hours before. Is, is supposedly anyone could, but it's a lot of fun. And Brian is a great guy, so. Um, we will try to deliver the first, uh, uh, let's say, uh, external order uh, to him. Uh, and uh, uh, then, uh, of course, we have the shipping dates, which is drastically different. Shipping to US obviously will take longer uh, with uh, sea transport versus Europe, where there is only uh, a few days of road transport. Uh, so that will, of course, play some impact as well. Uh, yep. <clears throat> Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, just a quick one. What's it like? You know, you said five thousand orders, and being one of the founders to to have that expectation, and then to nearly triple that in in about a year. What's that? What's that feeling like? And and how have you changed your kind of expectations for the future? Yeah, uh, I mean, I I almost I mean, normally I have a tendency to you know think big uh looking back in my previous company that 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 we built and so on and uh we did create a few products you know of course drastically more simple but that became the best selling product in the world in in their categories and uh, yeah. you know when we created this company we thought that we could achieve that but it would take longer uh, essentially but where we are right now, I think we are going to be the leader in motocross quite soon. I think if we could deliver bikes the full quantity that the market would demand, I think we would already uh, be the market leader, uh, which, you know, it, it's it's a fun goal to achieve. Uh, but it's going to be depending on how fast we can scale, essentially. So this is what we are fully focused on right now. Uh, so we have a you know a very strong team from the motorcycle and automotive industry that is working uh, ext extremely hard uh, to achieve that, and uh, we are getting there. And uh, let's let's see how long it will take us. I, I think it does change the mindset a little bit on other uh, products as well. So we are very proud of what we have developed with the Varg, but. We want to achieve this in more categories as well, and uh, perhaps you know push the boundaries, push technology a bit further. We have some uh, very creative ideas of how we can make even better electric motorcycles in in, in other categories as well. So uh, uh, we are 
dedicated and uh, focused on that as well. Of course, our main priority is delivering the VARG. This is our, you know full attention, but we do already have separate teams uh, focused on, on other uh, motorcycles that, that we will launch as well. So uh, I think perhaps the, the success that we've had so far with the VARG has pushed those things a little bit faster than what it would have been otherwise. Yeah. Um, I mean, but, I, yeah. Quick question I just thought of is, um, it was almost uh, almost a year ago that uh, that Ryan got to ride the bike in in uh, Spain, and you mentioned you know you guys went back and kind of uh, revisited some things. Um, the bike that I guess is going to come to the market now is is it going to be much of a difference? I mean, obviously a lot of people were very impressed with that bike even uh, even even then. So is there is it just uh, I guess durability things, or is there actual changes in specifications and performance things? Yeah, I think that's that's a great question. So, um, Ryan, you you rode the sixty horsepower version. Um, yeah, which is still which, very fast. Would you want more? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I remember, <laughs> if you remember my video, I uh, yeah, I definitely had a little tumble uh, when mm -hmm. I rode that thing. But yeah, it was super fast, and I think uh, even a lot of the new four fifties are right in that sixty, right around sixty horsepower range. So I remember you guys saying eighty um that was a big number so yeah i totally agree with sean's question just kind of what are there going to be any differences or or can you yeah. talk about those yeah so um the the 80 horsepower version is insane <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's it's a lot of fun i'm i'm the kind of person that really i want ridiculous power like way more than you need just because like it's so ridiculous you know it makes you laugh basically you know so it's, it's a lot of fun to ride but yes yeah, so, so that is of course a new experience uh, for you uh ryan and that that is not changing the original specs of course um there have been some some changes um overall we have tried to make the best possible product so we did take one decision which uh, we have not made official yet. We will do that very soon. Um, where we invested a little bit more from our side uh, to make it a better product, not changing the, the customer price, but we decided to spend a little bit more to, to make an even better product for uh, for the customer. And, and we will speak about that very soon, but I cannot say today, unfortunately. So uh, uh, th th there's one thing there. Uh, there is one thing that we have not mentioned yet that I would actually like to share with you guys uh, today. Uh, so uh, I don't think anyone is aware about that yet. But we, one of the components on the bike, which I don't think you actually got to try, Ryan, uh, is it might sound silly, but it makes an incredible difference actually to the performance of the bike. We developed our own tubes. We call them Stark Power Tubes. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the in the wheels and it's using an incredibly strong uh plastic uh polymer uh polymer which is significantly stronger than uh, uh traditional synthetic rubber which is used in tubes today uh, which means that in the wheels front and rear you save uh, two kilos, approximately two kilos in weight, and uh, you well, which is a bit more than four pounds, um, which is rotating unsprung mass. So you know it's it's like the best weight you could say basically right. uh, on the bike, uh, and we call them power tubes because there is a substantial difference in how powerful the bike feels with uh, uh, with these. Uh, so it's a uh, it's a quite cool product, so super, super thin, super light, but actually the nail penetration resistance is stronger than traditional tubes. Uh, so um, uh, it is something that we have not spoken about before because we wanted to do quite extensive testing before we unveiled it because we didn't want to do it if the durability wasn't the same or better uh, than, than traditional tubes. But now we know that it is. Uh, so cool. th that's gonna be a, it's very might sound very simple, but uh, it has a tremendous. It, it's gonna it's quite funny, you know. It's many times more performance improvement than uh, let's say a full titanium exhaust on your 450. Wow. Uh, 
<laughs> significantly cheaper, of course. So, uh, so would this be something that you would offer as an aftermarket <laughs> item to improve uh, in other bikes? I mean, you can it's for sure. You know, it yeah. it will fit in uh, uh, any other normal uh, eighteen, nineteen inch rear wheel or or twenty one. So that's mm. that's for, for sure possible. But it was a quite uh, fun development project that we did here. Um, and then, of course, the rest is optimizations uh, that we have done uh, to make sure that we make an extremely durable product that that we think is more durable than any of the competitors. Um, so there are hundreds of minor small improvements that you you know you wouldn't notice yeah. kind of piggybacking on what you're talking about the investment um <laughs> a, a few months ago there was a press release that you guys got some investment from the parent company of royal enfield can you talk about that a little bit or how that came about and how it's being used or just anything like that yeah yeah for sure i mean so building a um a factory and a company like this, uh, you know, requires a lot of capital, and uh, uh, we have invested roughly a hundred million euro or hundred dollars, uh, roughly, in the company so far, and uh, we wanted to bring in a new investor. So we had a few discussions uh, with with various investors um, last year, and in uh, then we got in contact with. Uh, Royal Anfield uh, or Asia, which is the parent company, which I think is an extremely impressive company. So I think most, maybe a lot of people in in Europe and US are not so familiar with this company, but it's right. it's basically the the fourth or the fifth biggest motorcycle manufacturer in the world. Um, they sell the majority, the vast majority of their of their bikes in Asia, uh, where they are a premium player in in that market, and. In the 90s, I think they had a yearly quantity of something like 15,000 bikes. So they were a very small player, you know, the company was almost dying. And then uh, Sid, who is the, his family is the majority owners and uh, he's the, the chairman of the board of, of Weisher and, and Royal Enfield, um, decided to to focus on that company. He thought, you know, we could do something great here. And Royal Enfield has such a heritage. It's such a cool company. Let's see what we can do. And he did that together with the management of the company, and they built it up to more than 800,000 motorcycles per year in production, uh, becoming one of the biggest players in the world in, in a quite short period of time, uh, let's say, you know, 20 years. And uh, there are very few people that have done that. So if you look at the other biggest players in the world, they have big, been big for so long, but these guys that are running this company today they built it up from scratch. So they have a tremendous experience in how you scale production and also achieve quality. I mean, there are in many of the many quality tests, you can see that they're winning them, you know, in front of the, the biggest brands in the world. So they're really, really focused on quality as well. So we were very happy to bring them in. They are they also have very entrepreneurial uh, mindsets, uh, similar culture from that perspective. Uh, they have an extremely impressive track record in how you scale production and achieve very good quality. Um, and of course, we also uh, uh, wanted additional funding so we can scale this uh, company and scale up production uh, as much as possible. Uh, so so that is the, the main reason. We are extremely happy to have them on board. Uh, we're working closely together and they, they are helping us in terms of scaling and uh, uh, we will try to support them as well as as well as we can uh, in in their efforts towards uh, electric. Yeah, so Royal Field is uh, here in the U.S. as you as you mentioned, is probably not that well known, but um, they've grown a lot from a small base, but but they've grown pretty rapidly here in the U.S. in the last few years, and and like you said, they actually make some very impressive bikes. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a little different, uh, different end of the of the spectrum from where I think the start bargain is being a high performance bike, but uh, but the quality level and uh, price points and things like that on on the Royal Enfield uh, line is really strong. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, it is vastly different, which is also good. We are not competitors uh, at all, uh, but we can still help each other uh, with with various things to make both companies better. Yeah, no, that's a really great point too about their uh their recent you know success is a, is a lot of uh, knowledge that can be applied to uh to the challenges that you guys are facing with building a new brand yeah yeah 
We think so. Um, another thing, I guess, uh, to, to go over, I know from the beginning, there's been a lot of talk about where do electric bikes fit in racing, both at like kind of the recreational racing level as well as the pro racing level. And I know you guys have ambitions to be comp competing against the, the traditional internal combustion motorcycles, but uh, I think the racing organizations uh, have a lot to say about that at this point. Um, I guess where where are you guys uh, on that front and what what kind of discussions have been out there and, and what do you expect to be, I guess, in the coming years? Yeah, I mean, a very interesting subject. So um, I think by now we can see that as an amateur, you're basically allowed to race globally now with electric bikes. And in most countries, they have all of their, some rules were changed in some markets. Uh, and many other countries have already changed the rules now so that from this year you are able to race. It's It's really moving forward quite well. In terms of the highest level, like uh, World Championship or AMA Supercross, uh, these kind of competitions, um, we are not there yet. We want to compete at the highest level because I think that is, we we know that our bike is competitive enough to win at that level. Uh, but we need to prove it. And the only way to prove it is to line up at the same gate and uh, and to win the race. But you know, there is a lot of uh, politics in, in racing and uh, the established uh, OEMs, they, they are pushing back very, very hard from allowing us to race. Uh, I, I think they are afraid uh, to see what could happen. And uh, I could understand that. I think it's the wrong approach. If, if we can offer something that is better, uh, but let us race you know on the same gate as you we're happy to uh, let's say adjust so that we work with the same power levels as any of the combustion bikes and happy to adapt so that it's fair racing but if our bike is is competitive it should be allowed to be there if if your the race is with the fastest racers in the world why wouldn't you allow the, the fastest bike there then it you know then it's maybe not racing at the highest level so we will see when we get there. I think um, um, some of the OEMs are pushing back extremely hard. Uh, I'm sorry to see that. I I wish they would be more open to competition, uh, but it's clearly not the case. Let's see how things evolve. I think as customers start receiving their bikes and as they go racing, things will have to change uh, at some point. Uh, but uh, we haven't made uh, enough progress yet. Yeah. No, that'll be an interesting one to see how that plays out because you know I, I can I can see both sides of it. You know, you, you want to have all the other manufacturers want to continue to be involved. And if they feel like they're gonna get pushed out, of course they're gonna fight hard to, to keep it as it is. But yeah, um it's maybe, uh, maybe they should spend all that energy building an electric bike instead. <laughs> yep, or whatever it is, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, whatever it is, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I agree. Touch, touching on that racing point, uh, I don't know if anyone's really talked about uh, since Ken Roxon went over there and got to ride your guys' bike. How was that experience? Uh, that was that was so cool. I mean, uh, uh, one of the fastest guys in the world coming here yeah. to try the bike. Uh, you know, it was uh, a huge, huge experience and that just an achievement for us to to have and like, bring enough interest for him to come here and try it. So that yeah. We were very happy about that. Uh, it was a very good experience to have him here. A uh, great guy, and uh, no, he uh, he seemed to like the bike. Um, so uh, yeah, I think I think it was good good for us to get some testing data with someone at his uh, uh, level. You know how how he rides the bike and uh, listen to his uh, feedback. And uh, yeah, I I got the impression that he enjoyed it uh, as well. And uh, now he's. Uh, it's clear to see, you know, he's still competing at the highest level, doing very good results this year with uh, Suzuki. So, uh, very happy for for him. Yeah, that's cool. I'm pretty sure that video almost <laughs> broke the internet that day. That was a pretty <laughs> cool thing. I'm sure it was good for you guys too. Yeah, yeah it was a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Um. Yeah. I guess uh, Ryan. Any other questions from your side? Yeah. You kind of you kind of tagged my one about the racing. Um. Uh, and just kind of some of the. I don't know if there's any more specifics you can really talk about as far as you know some of the pushback or anything like that that you're having, but 
Um, obviously, like I know even for some of the local levels or even like the Loretta Lynn's race uh, here in America, they, they do offer the micro uh, electric race. So I know like KTM has uh, the electric 50 um, and there's a class for those. So obviously, Anton, I'm sure you're optimistic for that moving forward to be, you know, a bigger, uh, higher displacement class, things like that. Yeah, I mean, we want to race against gas. This is uh, for us the focus. We don't want to be in a in our own class racing against ourselves. You know that uh, that would feel a bit ridiculous, uh, or, yeah. or at least you know not as exciting. You want to have a competitor. If you know, uh, of course, you know if if I'm racing against a friend on the Varg, I'm competing against him. But we as a manufacturer, we want to compete against other manufacturers. So uh, that, that is very important for us. And uh, we're happy to race against other electric manufacturers as well, you know, as soon as we have some, some competition. Um, but uh, for now, the, the competitors are uh, the big uh, gas OEMs, which, which we want to race. And uh, I think, you know, just for everyone that is organizing racing events or that you're a track owner or, or so on, you know, it's, it's quite a good opportunity to uh, being allowed to to have these events whenever you want, there is uh, suddenly no problems with noise. Uh, so, uh, if you have a track today that is open two time two times per week, you know I'm sure your as a business model, if you could be open seven days a week, it would be a lot better, of course, and uh, extended hours. Uh, now we are riding two shifts, so we're also riding evenings uh, with lights out, which in most cases wouldn't be possible because people don't want to be disturbed when they want to go to sleep but you know in our in this case you're you're clearly not disturbing them but any other sport you know you can do that you can have uh, lights uh, uh, next to a football field and, and you play in the evening it's completely normal but uh, in our sport we're used to riding you know these short hour windows a couple of times a week uh, in, in most track locations which i think can completely change everything uh, which with electric so I think it has a lot of benefits for the sport and uh, just hope that more people <laughs> can agree with me on that. Yeah, I've, so I've had the opportunity in L. Ryan. I obviously got to ride uh, the Stark. I did, I've gotten to ride um, some other electric bikes and even even entry-level electric bikes um, open up a lot of windows, you know, a lot of doors for places to, to go ride. Um, that I think uh, a lot of people don't realize until you get to go out and, and nobody even knows you're there, you know, like you're, you know, it's just uh, with, without noise, the noise uh, complaint, uh, it does open up a lot of riding avenues and, and closer to where people live and those kind of things as well. So, yeah. Yeah, it does. And I mean, uh, we were out a couple of weeks ago doing some trail riding, uh, three guys on, on one borg each. And, uh, you know, for the first time we could, talk to each other while riding i mean normally you, you can't do that you have to stop turn off the bike and then you could say something but here you know i can just shout to my friend in front of me hey go left over there and you know it's such a nice experience so i, I just look forward to having more people uh, trying that yeah yeah no, there's a lot of a lot of definitely a lot of cool things about it i've uh I, like i said i've experienced it on some of the some of the more entry level bikes and then and then even from uh Riding on, on real technical terrain, uh, not having to worry about being in the proper gear, installing the bike and those kind of things. Mm. Uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to try that with uh, like on an enduro cross type course with with an Ulta that was very popular a couple of years ago on uh, for enduro cross. There was some guys racing them and even even a rider finished on the podium with one um, in the pro class. And uh, I like riding it for me i i was able you know being a kind of middle of the road you know vet level rider it allowed me to tackle terrain that i would not even be able to to do when i had to like worry about being in the proper gear and the clutch and all those kind of things yeah no it's uh i think it will change a lot you know riding technique and uh and those sort of things as well and uh looking forward to when you get to try the bike as well sean uh perhaps in u.s yeah, can't wait. Again, you hopefully you guys get to do a cool intro like you guys did in yeah. Spain. I didn't since I didn't get to go to that one. I guess uh, is there any concluding points that you'd like to make and and a story you'd like to tell here to kind of wrap up for for our readers? I think uh, you know just for all the customers waiting there, um, we are working extremely hard uh, to deliver bikes, and you know uh, 
people are working you know 12 16 hours per day uh, to push through we're doing everything we can to get the orders out today uh, we we don't want to compromise uh, so it is really difficult to you know take the decision when will we deliver that bike but you know we appreciate the patience that, that people have had and we're now extremely close to that first delivery and we will continue to push uh, for everyone to receive their order.